Welcome back to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. I'm your host, Hisham Azuz. And on this week's episode, I was joined by the first Irishman in the podcast studio. And that is Anthony Kelly, who for the last two years has been building a successful career at Trust in Soda. He's achieved four promotions in four years. And in this episode, we covered everything. We really dug deep into how Anthony has been able to merge modern methods with old school methods, how he leverages meetups and podcasts to build his name, build his client base, how he went from building a market entirely from scratch to building the team of the year, the team of the quarter, and many other achievements. If you're someone that's aspiring to be the top performer within your company this year, you have to listen to this episode. Enjoy. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Isham, great, uh, great to be here. Great to finally meet you. I know. I was saying you are the first Irishman to take a seat in the studio. Proud moment for you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> first time we've met after about, I think, 14 months now. Yeah, we've, we've, we've known each other for a little while, haven't we? Obviously, um, got involved with Recruitment Mentors, the learning platform. Got to know each other a bit there. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been really looking forward to sitting down with you. I think obviously you, you dropped me a couple of nudges to say like, hey, look, when, when am I getting my call up? I think the last one was obviously a great achievement last year, being a top performer globally and in, in, on the perm side of things, Intra Novo. And uh, yeah, was was really looking forward to sit down with you. So there's a lot that we're going to go over. I think we were just saying before, definitely going to have a real focus in the last two years, because I think it's fair to say that's where you've had some real exponential growth in, in your career. And um, but we'll touch on just early days, learnings, looking back. But we'll, we'll mainly focus on the last two years. So I guess where I always like to start is I'd love to get your thoughts on what you believe are the common characteristics and traits of a successful modern day recruiter in your view, and then we'll we'll kick it off there. Good, yeah. I'll um I'll try and go for the ones that people don't generally give. You mm. know, people will always tell you you got to be able to take the highs and the lows and, and come back at it. I'd actually say hard working when you get like new jobs on and if you get a new job on at half five and if you're out the door at six o'clock and if it's an exclusive job or even if it's not an exclusive job, you're probably not going to fill it. Mm. You need to be able to put the hours in when necessary. Don't say it, don't mean you have to do it every day. When it matters to be able to do it. Um, and then I'm going to say something that's, I don't know, a lot of people would say it, but I'd say courageousness. Courageousness. A lot courageousness in the sense that yeah, do a podcast, do a meetup, do a blog, do something different to get your name out there, do the stuff that makes you uncomfortable mm. um, to build your brand. Because I think that's that's a mixture of you know hard work and something older, courageousness, something yeah, a little bit newer. I like that. So work ethic, you, is that something that you believe you've always had? Something that you grew up with, <laughs> you were surrounded by? That's all I have. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where that? Where's that come from? Do you know, I, I don't know. I think like, I had my first job when I was 14 years old. Really? I worked in a nightclub. Uh, hanging up 14? Yeah. In a cloakroom. I worked there up until I was 22. Wow. But even in between then, I used to, summer holidays, work on a building site doing labour. And then other weekends, my u- uncle's best friend owned his own, his own clothing store. And I used to work on the shop floor while still being in the nightclub on weekends. <laughs> Love that. So you've always, yeah. So you worked from an early age. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So if we just to touch on the, the sort of early days, when when would you say your career truly started? Then was it when you got into recruitment at S3? Was it before that? What, what would you say? Well, I was to tell you uh, to put it this way. I got into recruitment when I was twenty two. Uh, when I was 21, I got sacked from Nando's. <laughs> so, you got so, sacked from Nando's, 21? Yeah, yeah, what for? Yeah. What did you get sacked for? I gave my friends and family discount out to <laughs> someone without, without management approval. <laughs> so, so to say there was a career glow up after getting let go from Nando's wouldn't do it justice. <laughs> I love that. Okay, cool. So how did, um, there's always normally a story. How did you end up going from Nando's and that experience to, to working for S3? Um, so I actually went from, from Nando's, I was trying to find jobs um, and I spent actually my last bit of money to try and get interviews everywhere uh, on getting a suit uh, and I was getting off, I couldn't get an interview because I was young, no education, mm. like I've used call it, I think it's a GCSEs, yeah. I failed those, dropped out of community college, yeah. I got sacked from Nando's, mm. pretty unemployable at, that, at the age of 21 and then uh, I got a job in a call center. Okay. And I was there maybe like 
14 months and in 14 so months that's your first proper office yeah job. yeah and in 14 months i went from being like you, you know what was you selling the, was you set was it sales yeah w white papers uh, white pa what do you mean like you would paper no white papers uh, okay. like, like information sheets about right. emerging technologies sorry got you got you yeah basically it's like, like publications these were publications yeah, kind of like lead generation okay ish and then it would go to like ibm or dell to try and sell to the person I spoke to. Really oh. strange. I actually don't know how that industry still makes money after so long. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a successful industry. And I went there, I was there 14 months. But like after six months, I was made like trainee team leader to team leader. Mm. Um, so you just really applied yourself? Yeah, yeah. Took a lot of hours again. You're talking mm. 70, 80 hour weeks, Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. I'd be in for when the... Uh, West Coast, East Coast of the US would open mm. and I'd finish when the West Coast closes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was a um, tough industry. And then I got, uh, I'm sure you probably even know him, Berker, Acer, used to be on S3's uh, talent acquisition. Okay. He messaged me and said, hey, would you be interested in recruitment? I was like, no, nah, it sounds like a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> um, then I had a really bad day at work one day and I messaged him back and goes, hey, is this recruitment thing still going? Yeah. Yeah, and then that was it. I went for an interview and... There we go. Joined, uh, jo joined S3. And then what, what would you say, what's the career in recruitment given you that maybe you least expected? I, I always like to ask that question. For me, I would say the biggest thing that it's gave me is a, a level of communication skills that I, I'd never had. Mm. The way you can interpret situations, the way you can speak to people, a level of calm, calmness when, you know, generally situations should be high pressure. I mean, if you can have, you know, six dropouts in six, in six weeks, it's pretty hard to get stressed after that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say those sort of characteristics, being not even being more personable, but just being more actual, being able to listen to people a lot better. Um, and I think that really goes goes a long way. And I say this because these are like skills that I was traditionally really bad with really bad when with, I was yeah. younger. I used to be very, I suppose, selfish. Mm. And used to be like, yeah, so what? I, I used to have a bit of a, a bravado that okay. wouldn't have been very... Uh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's such an interesting point. I think, communi obviously, I'm sure you see it now in your management career, but being able to effectively communicate is just such a valuable skill. Not necessarily just in a sales environment, but just in life in general. So I think that's really interesting that that's something that, yeah, maybe it's really given you and equipped you with, that clearly it wasn't something you was really strong at before that. How would you describe your first year in recruitment? Was it tough? Um, Difficult? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was tough in the sense that it was time consuming. Mm. You know, I, I joined uh, S3 and there was like 12 of us, 12 trainees joining at once. Mm. And now look, I remember looking back, we were all there for nine months. And over the nine months, I built more than all 11 of them put together. Really? Um, but I was there every day, you know, seven or eight, out pulling my own business. I was like a whole school. I was picking up. I was like, hey, can I get uh, can I get budget? I want to just walk by this company's office and drop them in coffees and donuts. <laughs> and I was like, because I've not got a busy day today, so I'm going to make myself busy. But I think like they were very supporting and willing to do that. Uh, but I mean, other than that, I mean, I would say I would say I really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, yeah, so you just found yourself in an environment where basically, if you really applied yourself, you got rewarded. Yeah, yeah. I think normally, if obviously you're doing the right things and learning from maybe challenges, and mistakes, but. A lot of people will say who who I've had on here that were part of that S3 culture for a period really talk highly of the training, the development. Curious, like what what would you say you sort of still live by now or use today that maybe you learned really early on in your recruitment career out of interest? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, it would be that one as well, having a reason to drop into someone if you can't speak to them mm. and you're somehow passing their office, have a reason to drop in. Um, something that I was that was really helpful. I think it was Rachel Kelly that showed me this really well. R Rachel Kelly was probably the best mentor I've had when it came to learning in computer futures. This is S three, right? S yeah, S three. She's been there like eighteen years. Mm. Uh, she's won like top biller UK and Ireland um, for I'd say like fourteen of those eighteen years. Wow, she, unbelievable. She was the dot net market in Ireland. Rachel, if you're listening, we need to get her on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> she has that. She has that like. Down. Down, it's, it's yeah. Worth, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't even bother setting up in a, a competition. Really? Her, yeah. Okay, so she was a great mentor for you. Yeah, yeah. Even so much to like, if you were to work very close with her clients, she would make sure that you're working to her standard. Okay. Very specifically. 
and the way maybe it was just the way I took it you know she, she'd be very brutally honest in what you've done bad and then very complimentary in what you've done well and then she'd split the difference and like this is what you're doing well this is what you're doing bad um, to an extent that like if I was sending over a CV to a client I'd have to send it to her first for her to say okay why are you saying this candidate's done this that's not really relevant to this can mm. you tell me this and, like everything from that great now you've got that candidate an interview how are you going to prepare them what notes have you got for them you're debriefing them what notes can you get from them on the debrief that you can give to the next candidate going in for prep and she taught me basically to really good qualifications to really good preps to really good debriefs and recycling all that information back to give to the next person to basically increase your percentage of chance of placing with that Placement, client yeah. again. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's something that's really stuck with you. Yeah, yeah. And it's something that I now do training on to everyone within my business, really? in, in my teams. You can see it like Suki, for example, mm. he has a, we have a client and he was like, I, I know when I sent in my force five, new job, sent in his force five candidates. It was like, yeah, they all failed. It's like, boy, he's been building up his fourth round interview question since mm. and now everyone that goes in just passes the first interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay so and yeah. he knows that though he really he knows that's the story and that's why yeah okay i love that so obviously we touched on i guess a bit early days i guess like obviously i was, I was saying earlier a couple of sort of achievements tonight before we move in on to the last two years but obviously you was a from what i remember she was at s3 for nearly three years right yeah like you said, joined in, in a group of people, but one of the things that you had in your LinkedIn profile was, yeah, it was in the, the top two, top three consultant S3 UK Ireland one year in 2017. I guess you're just curious to get your thoughts on, and then we'll move on to the last two years. Like, that, that's a, a great achievement, right? Would have been a really competitive environment internally. So, like, what would you say looking back were some of the, the other standards that you live by or principles that you think you really took on board, live by day in, day out, that really enabled you to, to achieve those achievements, you think? Yeah, um, I suppose what I would say what made my time different, like in my second year, I won Best New Coming Rookie, which was people between 13 to 14 months. Um, and halfway through the year, I was like, I'm going to win it, I'm going to win it. But halfway through the year, I was like 80K off the pace. Really? And this is what I would say was from that moment to like the end of the next year, it just really kicked on. kicked on. Like I was doing three, four placements a month consistently for like a year and a half. Wow. Like to the extent that I was made like 60, 70 placements in a year and a half. Wow. It was a low fees market. Mm. But it's still, when I say low fees. Like if it's consistency, 10K, that's, that's the 10K. thing. 10K. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> still pretty decent. Mm. But I would say like what, what I've done differently is, is I stopped saying hello, Computer Futures, Anthony speak. And I started saying, hey, how you doing? It's Anto. Um, Anto. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's what my friends call me, and I think that level of personability just came through and fed through to my candidates when I was asking them, "Hey, available for a follow up?" It gave me like a different element of like candidate control. I was meeting everyone, video calling everyone if they were abroad, but I was Anto. I wasn't Anthony, even though like S3 itself was really professional. Mm. I I made me very personable. Um, and I think that gave me just like so much benefits out of it. I can't so exactly say what it is, but it just no, I get what you changed mean. everything. You really, yeah, you 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 really brought your authentic self yeah, to yeah. every interaction and relationship. What do you think interested? Because I'm sure this is something you maybe help people with now, and maybe the the environment you're in now at Soda, it's a bit more from what I from the people I've met and what I know about the brand might be a bit more free reign to bring that to work but I guess what what do you think maybe held you back I don't want to say hold, held you back but why do you think it took that long for you to to bring Ampho to the to to the to work life or take that approach you think? S3 you used to have to wear suits and shorts and toys mm. it was it was that it was just that that simple you know there mm. was no uh like if it was a sunny day 25 degrees outside we're all in the office an old Victorian building roasting mm. you have to get an email from the director to say yeah you can take your toys off okay, no. even even if you're not at a client meeting there's no clients coming into yeah. our office it's just 50 people on one yeah. floor you know so i think that comes back to courageousness right that you use, use courageousness to i'm assuming you didn't go in there walking with flip-flops and shorts <laughs> but like you you made the decision was like you know what i'm gonna really bring myself to work and be myself and you then obviously saw the rewards of that people brought into you, that authentic authenticity. Yeah, I, I find that so interesting. 
So let, let's talk about the, the last two years then, because we're, we're saying just to frame this up, obviously an amazing uh, achievement last year, 2021, obviously top perm consultant across the group. I mean, there's, there's a good amount of people that's against, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Do you know exactly? Um, 4,000, I think it was, isn't it? Really? Okay. Love that. So, um, like, let's just, let's just frame this up, because I think, obviously, you were saying to me it was your best year, right? Best year billings-wise. What, what did you finish last year on? Uh, it was like 610, 612. And that's best year you've ever had? Yeah. And obviously the, the important context here for people listening is that's also a period where at this beginning of the year, you were, it, was just, it was just you. And then by the end of the year, you was at six people. You was a billing, in a billing manager role, six people in your team. And then you've now got eight people in your team in the middle of obviously the, this 2022. Yeah, I, yeah? Think, I think the thing I like about it the most though is six months before me joining, the Soda had never touched an AI or data client in Germany ever. So there was zero candidates and zero clients and zero businesses mm. from the day I started. Yeah, that's nuts. Is that <laughs> so, you should be proud of that. Very proud of it. Yeah. So let, let, let's unpack this then. So I guess, why don't, we, why don't we first start then, I guess, towards the beginning. And with what you just shared there, why don't we just talk a bit about what was the game plan for you to, to go to the German market, do those particular niches that you were going to focus on, what what was the the approach that gave you confidence that it was going to work or things were going to work? Like talk to us about the the early period and what what the game plan was. Yeah, so I guess uh, when I when I was joining initially, I was telling Dave Ash and Ollie, yeah, I'm going to do data and AI, which obviously is a big part yeah, of big, any business. A lot business. goes into that. You know, it's a big pillar that like we can build this out, mm. to make a lot of placements here, and then like a week in or like three or four days in, I goes, no, I've I've changed my mind. Can I do computer vision? <laughs> so someone turned around. I was like, "What the fuck is computer vision?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh, it's self-driving cars, self-checkouts, all video-related, camera-based mm. technology." Ali just said, "He's like, I've no idea what it is, but if you think it can work, uh, I'll back you. Just go ahead and do it." Um, so I spent two weeks without picking up the phone. Two just, weeks without picking up the phone. Just adding contacts and businesses to try and understand who was the companies that hired mm. computer vision. Where were they? And then how can I start to make connections with them? So did all the legwork of like the market mapping, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just quickly, Matt, because this is really common. Like, if if I was in your team tomorrow and we identified like a particular niche, what what like what does market mapping actually mean? Is it that I'm just going on LinkedIn, I'm looking at all the companies that have this certain technology or certain thing that I'm going to be focusing on? Then I'm going to add the hiring managers. Then I'm going to be trying to grow my network of candidates. Like, what what is that marking? What, what do you actually do in that market mapping period? Well, I guess that's exactly it. You want to find out exactly every single company and what technologies they use. Like, I was going through just searching computer vision Berlin, like going through every single LinkedIn search page, mm. looking for candidates who had just computer vision in it to see what companies they were at. Because some companies could be like four people big. Right. In computer vision, they're all startups. Mm. So you'd have to just find out who had computer vision engineers. Because mm. if you look at it now, there's probably like over the last 90 days, 400 computer vision jobs posted on LinkedIn. Yes, it's growing. And half of them are probably from like big companies like Facebook. So you mm. take all them away, about 50. So you weren't building a market looking, right. for, looking for open jobs. Mm. You were being very proactive in, in who you can get on. I mean, it paid its dividends. I mean, sometimes I was getting business on with companies where I'd made like three or four placements with in a couple of months. They didn't even have a careers page. Really? So I was like, my competition definitely can't even yeah. find so what, these. Why is that beginning part so important in your opinion? Because a lot of people say that you need to do that donkey work, leg work early on. Why is that so important? Because if you try to do it while you're working jobs, recruiters like to work jobs. Mm. You get paid for filling jobs. Yeah. If you have even just one job to work over admin or market mapping, you'll resource a job, you'll speak to candidates, and you just won't do it as well as it should. Mm. I think it sets the ground for if you want to do social selling, mm. you can then mass market to the right type of people. Um, I mean, I mean, spending time really trying to find out right email addresses, not just adding it for no reason. Yeah. Like if I got a, a company that I wanted to add, I'd add everyone from the executive assistant to like the front desk, to the C-levels, yeah, to the managers. Get a full picture. Because I'm like, yeah, because no matter what I'm sharing in my industry, once it's about computer vision, everyone in this company is going to be interested anyway. And you never know. Some of the times I've had people come back who are like an engineer or mm. someone that wasn't necessarily directly affected by lack of hiring. 
but they were like, oh, I'll connect you with this person. And then they'll connect you, but then they'll write back and you'd have messaged that person 10 times before and not have a right, response. Yeah. But a referral from someone else in the business made a big difference. Yeah. So like I'd map, I tried to map every company as I can and then also every person in those companies. Yeah. And then just quickly on this, do you, is this something that you go to, now you did that beginning bit, and then is it something you make time for throughout the year? Is it something you look at on a monthly, quarterly basis? Just curious on that. On yeah, that I tried to do it, um, I tried to, find new companies at least once or twice a month once, yeah, probably you know one or two hours and then i know because because we know a bit about each other i know like you're so passionate about this the niche piece right and and being known for something and having a real focus which you're talking about there J just really quickly before we go into the sort of strategies and what's worked and, and challenges like what what sort of markers or indicators got you really excited about computer vision like for you to go to turn around to ollie and go look I know I said I was going to do this, but I really want to focus on this. Like, what is it that you got excited about? What it's do like, you see? I've gone from a market with 50,000 vacancies <laughs> to one with 50. It's, yeah. like, it's like, yeah, this makes perfect business <laughs> sense. <laughs> um, it was actually when I was finishing up my previous company, COVID was coming in. Mm. And every large enterprise we worked with, every large tech company, every company that had an internal talent acquisition team or recruitment team, shut off the taps. We're not using agencies. We're not using agencies. Every computer vision company, and I only worked with one at the time, mm. but I was able to BD and able to pick up two more while no one else was hiring. Mm. All were all happy to work with me. Mm. That's because they're small companies, they didn't have HR departments. You're like you're contacting the people who are directly affected by not having the, per, right the person, person in there, yeah. which is CTO. If you go into a one thousand or a five hundred person organization, CTO is not worried about that. Mm. And then there's probably too many barriers in between getting to the person that is, maybe they'll be like, I'll oh, go through HR, go to the hiring manager, there's too many blockers. But within this, you could contact the C-level executive who they need to spend VC money because they have to make these hires because they have to build a computer vision product. Because if they don't build it, they lose their investors or they can't go to the next round of funding. Okay, that's interesting. Hey everyone, a real quick one from me. This podcast would not be possible without our amazing podcast partners, Vincere, and Sourcebreaker. Because you listen to this podcast, you're able to get your hands on exclusive savings on both of these award-winning products. If you're a growing recruitment business, you have to check out Vincere, who are an all-in-one operating system for your growing recruitment business. With Sourcebreaker, if you wanna make sure that all of your recruiters have the best tools on the market to stand out and beat their competition, then you have to check out Sourcebreaker. Use the link in the show notes, in the comments below, and you'll be able to get yourself exclusive savings on these amazing products. So let, let's first talk about you as you sort of getting numbers on the board, building a name for yourself, making placements, building that client list. And then we'll talk about challenges that have come with like then doing that whilst they're managing, leading a team and all of that. So I guess if you if you look at this two year period then, what, what's been, because I know you're, you're quite passionate about this, I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts on it. What, what's been for you the most effective way for you to get known, liked and trusted by the, the companies that you mapped out and that you were going for. So what, what's been your most effective way of winning business, winning clients and, and, and sort of unlocking that loyal customer base that obviously loads of recruiters are aiming to do? Yeah, so I would say it's, I, I can't pick one. Sure. But like obviously to say social selling, like when you come into a market where you've got no reputation whatsoever hmm. and you want to just start talking to a load of computer vision managers, hey, how you doing? I want to do a computer vision podcast. Can we talk? I'd love to get you on it. Mm. And you can speak to 20 managers in three months. That's 20 actual relationships that you can try and leverage into business. Mm -hmm. You do an event, you can do the same thing. But then after you've made a couple of placements and you've got a decent little book there, you can start literally just picking up the phone. Hey, I see you're still advertising this job. Can I help you? No. Why not? <laughs> it's like we're not I know that there's not that many people doing mm. my market I'm like who he is using what's going on mm. I was like I can send you over letters of, letters of recommendation I'm working with like some companies of like the guy I'm working with the company of the guy who created computer vision oh wow he's now got a new startup in Berlin and I'm hiring for them mm. I just name drop him in it's like if he's working with me why won't you yeah yeah <laughs> um, but then yeah there's a difference I can use that to like maybe like a HR a line manager and then, you know, maybe next week I'm like, oh, I didn't like that. I'll ask him when I come to my event. 
I didn't come back. I'll ask you want to come to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's this cool blog I wrote. <laughs> yeah. Just something all the time. And I just make it that, uh, it was again a big reason why I picked the niche market. I'd say there's probably 500 companies in the whole of Germany that I can contact or that would actually hire in my space. So I'm probably targeting to hit them with some kind of CV content or information probably four to six times per month. Mm. Um, okay. So it's all relevant. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just to break that down a bit, because you mentioned social selling, right? So how, so like you said, I think that that's the key part to take away from that. There's like, if you're listening to this and you're relying on one method, one approach for you to grow your sort of loyal customer base, you're going to struggle, right? And, that, and I feel like that's what, that's what you're saying here. So like, just talk, talk to us through like, so right now, what are the sort of multiple ways that you mentioned a few of them, but just to be clear, what are some of the, the multiple ways that you would view help you grow that log customer base? So you said obviously a podcast, something that you started, you've got an event, event, like events that you run, you mentioned like blogs, are actual industry content, and then you said CVs. So like, just, 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 I guess just talk us a bit about that high level and on the different ways and why that is important and then we'll move up, move on because I think that's the key learning for people. So podcasts, again, I mean, if you can come across and do and deliver a very good podcast with someone technical, CTO, line manager, you're going to come across as their go-to guy, mm. you know, or, or, or girl, or whatever it's going to be. Next time they have a vacancy, they'll come back to you. Yeah. I mean, those can be the longer term games. You, you know, you can check them out. They don't have vacancies. You can ask them how the hiring is. You can always have them conversations. But... I would say 80 to 90 percent of the time they'll ask you two weeks before they know they have a vacancy hey do you have any idea what salary i should be paying or if this was to come out would you be able to help us <laughs> of course i would mm. <laughs> <laughs> um and then it's the same with the events but the events obviously is very much they can be quite hard because they're trying to get people in from speakers yeah. or from an event host on, yeah. into like conversion but when it happens you actually have a very lot very little one-to-one -one time with them but it can always be used as another one hey let's do the event but let's book a meeting up after let's see how everything went and mm. then you can look to convert it then mm. um and then information cvs they're like a little bit more quicker wins sometimes you don't get the long-term relationship out of them that you want sometimes they can be a quick a quick snatch deal mm. even though you know you could do a lot more with them some people are just not some people are just interested in a, in a quick placement and that's all they want you for yeah um but okay. i guess it's i guess it's about having having different arrows for your bow uh different weapons that you can use depending on on who it's going to be that you're working with yeah and like you said that enables you to build a short-term relationship short-term opportunities long-term opportunities so i guess th this was something that and i know again something that we spoke about just on the on this topic and it's something also that um Ollie dropped me a note about as well. So I think, and this is what we spoke about. So I think when I spoke to a few of your colleagues, they all sort of spoke really highly of you in the sense of like your approach to business development. And I think that the, the overarching thing that I took and when we sort of prepared for this was this sort of combining social selling, modern approach with old school methods, right? And I know we're talking about talking a bit about this now, but I guess how would you sum up or describe that you use things like podcasts, meetups, modern approaches combined with old school getting on the phone making things happen like how how would you describe that you you combine those yeah um i mean look it gives you a fantastic reputation when you pick up the phone to someone who is a computer vision manager or someone who hires in computer vision when they look at your linkedin like my linkedin looks like pretty pretty decent mm. You know, you can see it's very well accomplished. You can see the recommendations of ex guests. You can see lists and lists of people that have been there. I think it creates, like people seeing your face either at a meetup, at an event, people hearing your voice at a podcast reduces you being a stranger calling them for that first time. Mm. You know, whereas every other time you're just that same old recruiter trying to send them a CV, trying to make a placement and trying to leave them. Whereas these people have probably heard, seen, spoken, seen like so many things five or six times before. Um, and, and I think that's a, a nice way to get in and get some long term business. But then there's obviously, you know, some people are not interested in these podcasts and meetups. They're the people that, you know, you, sometimes you just have to make those calls to. I'm pretty sure that like I don't let people say that they won't speak to me. If they say they're not interested in working with me as a recruiter, I'm like, that's fine. I goes, what about coming to one of my events or, or, mm. or, my, or my podcast? It's like, 
these are very relevant to you in your industry. As a minimum, have, have you considered looking at these? I've never heard of them. Oh, cool. Why not? Yeah. It's like, I know, I know everything that's going on in your space in Germany. This is what I do. I share this information. Why, why don't you want to know what's going on? And then from them nearly going to hang up the phone to us like, what do you mean? <laughs> what is it that you do actually? <laughs> and then it's, okay. it's great. So, you know, I, I'm not afraid to, to get told no for, for anything mm. because if someone says no for working, I'm like, oh, great. Fall back. How about this? Yeah. What about like this? So it sounds like you've been really proactive. You're picking up the phone. Okay, cool. Got it. So I, w I want to segue into your leadership journey because I know that's really challenging for people and it seems like obviously you've, you've made that a success. But I guess before I do, um, people actually know, well, I was going to ask you about like your day plan and how you approach that because people always love that. But you know what, actually, let, let's, do, let's do that when we're also talking about you managing and leading people because I think that, that would be really interesting for people and like how you we're able to build that whilst also growing your team and how you how you manage that. So we'll, we'll touch on that. But I guess, look, we've, we've kept it quite positive. What, what would you say last year as you were growing your team? What, what was the most difficult part about it, about sort of keeping that performance high? Obviously, making you could probably sense that you was on track to have like a really good year, but then you wanted to grow your team, get the right people in. What, what were the, the maybe the challenges last year that maybe you least expected or came with that transition to management? Um, do you know what? I would actually say the challenges are coming now. Okay, more cool. so than we'll, last we'll year. Talk about that. L last year, it was like as soon as the team joined, everyone came together. It went from one to five overnight, mm. and it was like everyone was just in flow state. Like okay. e everything just happened. Like month two, full house. Month three, team full house. Yeah. I was like, this is this is unbelievable. There mm. was like a trainee on my team who done three deals in our first yeah, two so months. It was, all, uh, it was all going to plan. It was, it was just, she was signing terms. It was just like, this is, this is great. <laughs> uh, it was like, I was having some of my best months and yeah, it, it just worked out really well. Whereas now there's, there's me and seven. So there's a team of eight. My time has gotten very yeah. much restricted now. We're trying to help like Sookie's doing his mm. event. Mm. Uh, his first in-person event next, oh, wow. ne next week. This week. It's this week. The eight. It is, yeah, it's this yeah. week, yeah, yeah. So Sucky's doing his first event, so I'm going over for his event. Mm. Um, and then two weeks, I'm back over for my event. So I'm finding that... Juggling all of that. It's a lot of over commitment and then trying to make sure I have enough time for everyone. And I mean, having enough time for five people when a lot of the time you were able to be remote working anyway, now you throw in travel times. Mm. And yeah, it's just being, just being that quite bit stretched. So how, have you, how are you approaching it at the moment? Like, what's the current approach to it? Because I, I know it's not perfect. Yeah, how yeah. Are you, how are you thinking about it at the moment? This will be helpful for people because this will be a really typical journey that billing managers go on. So how are you currently thinking about approaching those time constraints and challenges? And Because I'm sure you're thinking, oh, that person on my team, do they feel like I'm letting them down? Do they feel like they're getting enough support from me? Like, how are you currently thinking about approaching it that you think is maybe working well? Or Yeah, um... I, w I would say I, I sacrifice time speaking to candidates okay. more so than speaking with my team. Interesting. Everyone on my team has a consistent one-to-one -one every month, performance management, bi-weekly training sessions. Um, I speak to everyone on the team at least once, at least. We Sometimes it might just be a 30-minute session, but mm. you know, some people are in the team now one year. That's, that's all they need. That's mm. all they want. They might just want to rant here for 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, there could be people on the team that want or need that little bit more support you know, maybe two 30 minute sessions per week to talk about their L and D, where they're gonna develop. Mm. Um, but with that as well, I always make sure that I'm booking out my own time for making sure I'm still doing BD mm. each week. So that like if I was, if I come into every week, there's there's twenty hours gone anyway. And that's between booking in BD and time with my team. That's interesting. Because it's 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 nice with a niche market, because also I'm like if I sp if I get a computer vision job on next week. I'll have 12 candidates in 24 hours and that's all I'm heard of in that market. Mm. Um, so I think choosing that niche has allowed me to be able to spend less time with candidates. Um, it, it's kind of like a Java developer. You either do Java or you don't. It's the same with computer but vision. But you've also got, the, you've got, you've got now critical, obviously, is it just you that does computer vision? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was going to say that you've then obviously grown a bit of a team where I'm sure that they do some, obviously they're building their candidate networks and these things. but. That's interesting. So, f so the insight there I got then is, which I guess oftentimes can slip for billing managers is your non-negotiables each week beyond supporting the team is you every single week you're showing up doing business development, existing relationships, new relationships is something that you you always make time for regardless. Yeah, yeah, and time with the team. 
yeah, yeah, I'm time with the team. And then maybe it's the candidates that you maybe don't have as much time, but you've really worked hard to build this network. So you know if you get these grade A jobs that there's, you know the type of people that you want to be calling that you can head on and speak to. Sometimes it's easier to win a new business to get five CVs, five existing CVs to that, mm. than get five new candidates for one existing job. What about what skill sets have has Anthony had to develop on this journey so far? What have you had to get better at? What things have you had to learn the hard way when it comes to um, management? I would say I would say like it's the it's the doing and the following up. Okay. Um, not, not even that. It's the the process behind it. Mm. Something that Ollie Perry is actually amazing at, and I try to replicate as much as I can. So you have your your team brief in the morning, Monday morning. And you let everyone out. You tell everyone this is what we agreed on. Here's our objectives. Here's our goals. Here's our actions. We'll catch up these on these on Wednesday. Let's see how everyone's doing on Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, you can link back to the email that you sent on Monday. Hey, how are you getting on? Based mm. on everything we agreed on. And then again, same on Friday, and then reset in between. So what um, are you doing? Just the email on Monday, and then no follow up. <laughs> but yeah, no, <laughs> is that no, what you're no, doing? I do, I do. I've, I've I've got good at it now. I've got good at the uh, setting the okay. emails, setting the nice. actions, the following up, and even I mean, you can do that from a, a one to one perspective, a team weekly objection setting perspective, one uh, like a monthly one to one personal development plan. Mm. If you do a training session, everything has actions and objectives after it that you're following up on. Whereas previously, I would have just been like, yeah, here's our meeting, fine, go on. Not know, like, and what that, we that, agreed. That, that was just it, you know. Yeah. Um, so the follow up and the process is something you've worked really hard on. Yeah, yeah. So you had to become a lot more organized. Do you know, it was actually just being able to manage to do that in time with that. So, so now I can do it while the meeting's happening on a dual screen. Whereas before, right. I was like, drowning and all the information coming in yeah <laughs> it was all so new to me but yeah okay balance and that was, was was quite nice i think that was that was really good anything so, else that you've really had to work on learn learn the hard way so you mentioned obviously the process the follow-up from a management leadership perspective is there anything else that you've had to get really good at do you think i mean i haven't really had to deal with much else it's just more so work with everyone very closely performance mm. manage one-to-one -one. yeah nice so I think this is, we spoke about this, but this is something also Oli mentioned about, and you, you mentioned it to me around, he, Oli really feels like you've done a really good job of creating like a mini culture in your team, um, which I, he was saying that, that he feels adds an additional purpose for people in your team beyond working for the overarching company. And probably something that recruitment owners want their best managers and leaders to do is that they'll they'll sort of die and live for the company but also their team manager and, and they're in it for, within the team so i think obviously you mentioned to me before we uh called right that your team's called the the cream team right team cream team cream team right cream, the yeah. cream rises to the top team cream rises to the top obviously Irish. What, what's Guinness. the idea behind this i know you had a bit of a philosophy around it but why why have you really intentionally built this mini culture and really tried to get people even further bought into what you guys are trying to build as a collective within the within the business i can't remember the book exactly it was in but it was definitely one of the management framework books and yeah. as i was saying it was about i can't even remember the coach now but it was england's most successful olympics coach and um, cycling or not? No, no, over, overall. Okay, got So you. they get like an overall team coach for everyone to go in. Right. And everyone like reports into him. He's, yeah. he's the team leader for 100 athletes to go over, right? Got it. And there is, the thing that stops most teams from being successful at the Olympics, and I didn't know this until I read that, is illness. Illness. Yeah, so they made this thing, it's like, let's be the healthiest team mm. ever. And then they called it like a totem, like a kind of like a ritual that they all had mm. to make sure that, because if one gets sick and you're all sharing a house together, so they're all going to get sick. So if you get sick, you're sacrificing that person's success and sure. so on like that. So let's all agree. We'll wash our hands. We'll sanitize our hands before we enter every room and when we leave. Um, and there was a couple of little rules like that. And that was, that was their totem. Anyway, it was the most successful English Olympics ever in history, even still to this day. I was like, cool, I was trying to think of that. I was like, I can't get everything. So that, that inspired you? Yeah. Do you yeah. do a lot of, do you intentionally make time for you to learn about how can you become a better leader, manager? Is that something you often do? Yeah, I would. I would not so much recently because I'm quite, uh, I don't have the time as much now, but I, I do need, that's not an excuse. I need to make time yeah. again. But but obviously when you went on the journey, it seems like you was quite curious about. Yeah, yeah, what, Okay, yeah. cool. So, so you was inspired by that. And then what did you think? What? 
what can I create? What sort of rituals can I create for, for my team or the team that I'm building? Yeah, yeah. And then um, I just came up. I was like, yeah, look, let's 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 call ourselves Team Cream because it was <laughs> it was kind of like joking at the time because mm. um, it was when when the team had just set up and like we'd been team of the month, team of the month, team of the month, team of the quarter, mm. like just in like our first month. I was like, oh, this is this is unbelievable. And then I just written to like one of the chats, yeah, the cream always rises to the top. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, we're, we're team cream. And then like from then it just, it just stuck. But then what I done is I took it a step further and I do like a three, six month rollout of where were we then? Where are we now? Mm. And basically, like showing accountability. So, like, let's say, like Suki, who's now gone into team leadership. Yeah. Like six months ago, we were rolling out. It's like, yeah, Suki wants to be here in six to twelve months. That means that as a team, we need to do this. Mm. But everyone then knows that if the team doesn't do this, it's actually impacting possibly Suki's growth. It's impacting right. the growth of the potential team. Mm. Um, so you're getting it? people to buy into that collective. Yeah. So I don't think people people often say in recruitment, "Oh, what what am I here for?" Am I just here to generate revenue to make sales mm. and do business? I'm like, great, yeah. Yes, you are. Um, but but in, in our team, you doing well, you doing well, and the whole team doing well, here's how it affects the person sitting beside you. Um, and we all got matching hoodies as well. Yeah, and you and you found people who really bought into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. So I guess as we, come, as we come to the end here then, what advice would you have for people listening to, to this that are also on this billing manager journey, maybe finding it really tough right now. They're in the, the trenches of like, I don't know, they've gone from like one person that they're responsible for to three to six. Now they're getting onto the next stage. Like what advice would you have to people that are on a similar journey to you that, that might be helpful? Um, the structure, the mm. structure of when you have a meeting, there's an agenda, goals are set out. And then after you're following up, what goals are set out, who's accountable for them and, and how they're going to achieve that. Um, and then making sure you're following up on that. Because if you're just setting goals and you're not following up on them, people aren't ever going to do what their goals are anyway. You know, mm. they're not going to go for their objectives if it's not. You might say, yeah, this is important, but then if you never follow up with them, how important is it? Yeah. They start, even if it is important, they start to think, oh, it's not that important anyway. He never asks, she never asks. Working on your own time management, um, which again, I know is easy, a lot easier said than done. But with me, I have, you know, blocked blocked out times in my diaries, which are non-negotiables every week that I either have for my team or, or for, for me yeah. to do something, whether it's from my desk or, or then specifically for my team and, and then team meetings. So let's just, as you mentioned that, let, let's just break down what, what a typical day looks like for you then as, as Anthony, the manager in a growing team, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. What, what does a typical day look like then? It's, it's more so typical week. Okay, cool, um, let's, do that. let's do that. So typical let's week. say if I say typical week, uh, I'll have week, start of the week, objective setting, midweek catch up, Friday, end of the week, done. So that's like team time, that's team time. Group, group team calls. Yeah. There is then individual time for every single person on the team. Mm -hmm. You have 20 minute sessions, probably, Six to eight of those per week minimum. Yeah. Maybe even a little bit. Is that the more. beginning of the week, end of the week? Um, mix, mix. mix Monday, okay. Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. Trying to mix it up so I still have good availability in core hours for myself. So I'm not. Sure. Unavailable. So you've got, yeah, the objective setting, the follow up, the sort of wrap up at the end of the week with the team group staff. Then you've got individual time, 30 minute sessions with the team. Then what else? Do you have any other team commitments? Uh, to, or? To try, no, that, that would be it, unless there's stuff coming up, unless it's uh, every second week, there's a team cream bi weekly training session. Team cream like that? Uh, yeah, bi okay. weekly session. And how long's that? Uh, that would be 45 minutes. What, over lunch? On uh, a typical day? End of the day on a Wednesday. Okay, and nice. that would be a topic that the team give to me. It's like, what do you want to know about? Whether it's interview preparation, mm. debriefs. Just maybe current challenges that are going through, things that are interested in. Yeah, closing techniques, stuff like Love that. that. So every other week, you've got a team cream training session, non-negotiable as well. Yeah, Love yeah. That. And then I've got my management calls that I'll have. So there might be two or three of those per week, maybe an hour or two. Yeah. Um, and then I do my traditional recruitment stuff that I can, even though I tell everyone to do it, there's not a lot of people so you still see doing it. Four hours of outbound BD every week two hours of candidate regens every week. Regens or something? Yeah, it's just regenerating candidates that okay. are old on the database. Candidates mm. I might have spoke to two years ago. Mm. Um, available What's now. What's going on, yeah. yeah so four yeah. four hours outbound client development. And two hours outbound uh, candidate development. Mm. Don't know what leads you get out of it. Yeah. Someone you might have placed or someone you might have not placed is now a hiring manager. I mean, it's already, even, even better yet, they're available. 
Love that. So, and then any other non-negotiables, like activities? So um, you've got four hours of that, two hours of that. Is there anything else or is that it? That would be it. You know, the rest of the time is what I'd use for sourcing, mm. maybe, uh, you know, calls with new candidates. Yeah, I love that. I love the non-negotiables around that. Thanks for sharing that. So I guess to, to wrap up then, obviously we're halfway through this year. What what have you got top of mind? What are you thinking about that is going to make sure that the cream rises to the top again at the end of this year? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm actually in the process of, of trying to place a whole team of nine people that were made redundant. Oh, wow. Um, which would be unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so if I do that, I'll be very happy. But uh, by the end of the year, Ideally, I'd have like, you know, setting up in new regions, Munich, Switzerland. Mm. Um, this way we can really, I guess the word, land and expand. Yeah. You know, we've got a successful team in Berlin. Uh, so, and you're yeah. all based in Ireland, aren't you, your team? Uh, or two, not? two in London, five in Dublin. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, I think we're going to be looking at a Berlin office in Q1 next year. Um, but yeah, just really looking at growth, getting in that second line of leadership. So Suki obviously mm. coming in. If I had my way, I'd get one more team lead. Mm. Um, again, that would be fantastic for me because then I can spend more time with Suki, a new and team lead, everyone, yeah. and then with more people, maybe let Suki manage two or three people. But mm. when it really comes to performance manage, I can help out with that. But and then how are we looking your own performance wise? We're going to top last year. I, I, I think so. I'm really gonna, gonna, on I'm, track. I'm going to aim for it. I'm not on track, but this month I'm going to. You're feeling good. I'm going to have a, a six figure month this month. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> pleasure, mate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed it and got value from the conversation. If you did enjoy it, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next episode.